Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is such a special day. Um, it's a day where, in addition to listening to stuff on stage and watching things on the screen, we're actually going to have a live performance uh, to conclude our event today. So I'm so excited about that. My name is Dr. Lynn Vartan, and this is Apex Events. We're rounding out our semester. And this event today is called Bringing Nama's Ark to Life. And so what you're going to hear is we have a visiting composer here from New York who wrote this amazing work, which we're going to tell you about and you're going to see a sample of today. And then we have a panelist of creators who are bringing this work to life here in Southern Utah for two performances, one in January in Salt Lake City at the amazing Cathedral of the Madeline, and then also January 12th here on SCU's campus. So that's kind of a little bit of a footnote outline of what, what we've got in store for you for this next hour. Let me tell you about our guest composer who's traveling. Her name is Marissa Michelson, and she is a composer and vocal artist, multi-award winning writer, interdisciplinary musical theater, choral work, musicals. She does all kinds of collaborative things and we've been learning about her art and her work. She is the founder of the Constellation Core, a really interesting and amazing spirit-based movement, vocal group, composing group that we're going to tell you more about today. Uh, her interdisciplinary musical theater piece, Song of Songs, won a 2017 creative Engagement Award from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Uh, Council. Other awards, 2018 National Endowment for the Arts Grant Recipi Recipient, 2017 Creative Engagement Award, a Jonathan Larson Award, an American Musical Voices the Next Generation Award, um, and also a grant to study Indian Hindustani singing in India. She's been in residence at the very elite McDowell Colony, uh, U-Cross Blue Mountain Center Theater works Palo Alto, uh, Montclair University, Millican University, and many others. We have just been having such a joyful collaboration this week. So I would like to welcome to the stage Marissa Michelson and the panel of creators that are bringing Nama's Ark to life. <laughs> Thank you so much for everybody for taking the time today in this amazing collaboration that we're getting going. We're going to start by just talking with Marissa about you know, what life is like as a composer. I, am, I know we have many music students in the audience, but I know we have students and faculty from other areas. And so we're going to start with that and talk to her and then bring in the rest of the panel and figure out what all these people do and what their parts are. So Marissa, would you please tell us about yourself and about your life and about what you do? Yes, I would. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you for that amazing introduction. So I'm um, a composer, and I run this ensemble, Constellation Core. And what that means in, in general is that I spend much of my day creating music um, in a number of different stages, generating material, and then working with software to notate it. And then I also spend an, uh, a lot of time working with performers, whether it's choirs or um, individual performers or uh, production companies when they're actually producing my work. And so we spend time together rehearsing and making the music and the theater that I hear in my mind come to life. And that's a great, great gift for me, as you can probably imagine, to get to hear what I hear in my head um, out in the space in front of me. So that's one thing I do. And then I also have this practice with my ensemble. We meet every week in New York City um, at 8 AM on Fridays for three hours. And we improvise and work on performance practices and generate new material. And that's a, that's a kind of overview. That's great. Now, yeah. is your training um, and this is sort of a leading question because I kind of know the answer to it, which is going to yeah. lead to the word composer. I, yeah. Is your training 
sort of the traditional composer training, it sounds like you come more from a performance background. Yeah, so my training um, in university was actually as a performer and as a, a singer, dancer, actor. Um, I was also studying classical piano my entire life and um, also writing music my entire life, um, but not officially. I did take a number of composition classes later on, but I was studying music theory and um, I was working on that when I was younger. But uh, yes, my, my entree point into being a composer came through my, my, um, my performance work in New York City. Yeah. yeah, and that does make a, a difference in the work that I'm interested in and doing, which often is coming from a space of me embodying the inner life of a character whose story I'm trying to tell and then figuring out how to, how to manifest that musically and emotionally through music. Well, I think that's yeah. a perfect lead-in to our first video, which I think we have. Um, this is a video that, that sort of shows that. It's, it's a, a, a brief, maybe about a two or three minute excerpt of a work that the, of the Song of Songs. And it's, it's you performing and doing kind of exactly what you were just saying. Do, is there any other lead-in for that that, that we need to This know? is, um, yeah, me performing with my ensemble uh, Constellation Core, and this is from the piece Song of Song of Songs, so it was inspired by text from that, from that poem, and I think you'll hear some of that text, my interpretation of it, and this was a piece that I developed through devised work, meaning I would be in the space with my ensemble members, trying ideas on their bodies, asking them to, uh, to give their input, and uh, creating prompts for them to explore the themes that I was interested in, and then I would gather all that and compose a piece. Okay. So, yeah. And I, I think we're maybe ready, yeah? Hopefully we've got that first cue up and running. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. Well, that brings up the, the next topic. Um, you talk a lot about 
a, a different way of composition, uh, composing in the body, from the body. And um, can you talk a little bit about that process and what that means to you and how, how that all works? Yes, definitely. So when I first was starting out, my, com my composition works were very piano-based, meaning I would sit at the piano whenever I was composing, and that would be where I would start from, was playing around, improvising. And then over the years, I became more and more interested in voice and body solely, which also went along with a kind of philosophy of life that I found myself drawn to, which was if, um, if there's only us as humans and we have our body and we have our voice, how deep can we go? What can we create? And so my process began to shift and I wanted to make sure that I was activating my own, um, my own energy and my own activated kind of inner sphere when I was writing. And for me, sitting at the piano or sitting behind a computer felt like it was cutting me off from my life force. So what I started to do instead was work first and foremost from, um, from my body. So I developed this process that is, is generally has three steps. And it involves first when I'm generating material that I will sit with something I am seeking to discover thematically or um, narratively. And I'll put that idea in my consciousness and I'll generally go outdoors because I, I really, I'm more inspired in nature. And then I'm essentially my, using mindfulness meditation to invite that thing to speak to me. And I'm breathing and I'm, I'm making sure that I'm present in my body and I'm allowing that, that um, object, you could say, to tell me what it is about. And then once I feel something alive inside of me that's, that feels inspired, then I get up and I move around and I, I, you could say kind of dance, although it's more just like movement, and I'll improvise with my voice and I'll explore the, the object through my own body. And then I will reflect on what I, what I discovered and use either um, large pieces of paper and I'll make drawings to remember, in a sense, what it is that I learned about this theme. Um, and then that's kind of the, the generative material process for me and it keeps me in my body. And then I can go and do the part that's sitting at the piano, uh, sitting at the computer and editing but I'm always making sure that when I'm at the new stage of creating something that feels like it's going to be um, the center of what I want to say, that it really comes from a place of inspiration. And it's not something I can force, but it is something I can prepare my consciousness for. So it also means, for example, I don't, I'm not on my phone beforehand very much. I'm not checking my <laughs> email or my you know, Instagram, um, just putting that away and creating a space where I feel like I can get super present on a deep level and allow the music to come out of me from that space. That's amazing. And you, you allude to you know, some of these tactics that you use personally. And I just wonder for, for our audience, not just for aspiring composers, but for anybody in our audience is looking to get more creative, get more present. Uh, do you have any suggestions for students who maybe are, have this, we all have this craziness in our life. Do you have any suggestions for anybody? No social media. <laughs> <laughs> right, you're you, you you have. Oh no, I have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh but yeah. Not too much. No, no. I, unfortunately, I <laughs> I also struggle with that. But um, uh, that is something that I feel like I have to be very protective of and very disciplined around. Is making sure that I'm I'm setting aside time to just go really deep. Or or yeah. For example, I took uh, a month off from all social media. Uh, this summer, or and that actually included email, that included anything, any communication essentially, um, even phone actually. Mm -hmm. So that that is something that serves me and my art making and helps me make sure that I'm I take in and I'm stimulated by information, but that I'm also giving my body and psyche and soul a time to digest and integrate that information before I'm taking in so much more. Uh, yeah. And meditation is an important part of your I process. do. I do yeah. meditate, yeah, and in various 
through various um, traditions and lineages. And it's helpful for me. I mean, I'm a person, because creativity has always been natural to me, I have a very active mind. Um, it's been important for me to find ways to balance that for myself, and meditation has been one of those things. Yeah. One of the things that's come up, I think, in our, in our working with you this week, and, and it's sort of obvious it's a, from your, uh, the way that you approach creativity, there, you have a life view that um, includes a lot of strong feelings about the way we are together in this world. Um, mm. And so I'm leading into the collaboration work that you do with, with Constellation. But even before that, um, I noticed that in, in your work, and particularly in the one we're doing, but in others, uh, diversity, inclusion. Um, in fact, Namaz is called a community oratorio. Can you talk about some of those themes and, and some of mm, the way you're approaching your music from uh, other aspects, the non-musical aspects that you're trying to get across to the world? Yeah, um, I do. So Namaz Ark, which is the one that you're all doing here, is is sl a slight departure for me, in a sense, from a, a, num a lot of my other work. But the priority of that piece has always been about the actual act of bringing together people from different musical traditions and cultural traditions to be making music together in a space, in real time. And that, um, oh, it's important to me, I guess, yeah, uh, community, Community is important in life. I mean, that's just, that's just true for, for everyone here. We're always in community. And um, I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm interacting with lots of different worldviews. Um, and I'm pretty radical about that, actually, because I truly mean all of them. And that I'm, I'm collaborating with people who will give me, um, expand my own perspectives. And then at the same time, and again, this is slightly different from how I approach some of my work, but I feel like as a um, privileged white person, I want to make sure I'm doing my best to also cultivate, um, friend, like bring in voices of people who don't have the same opportunities that I do. And that is something that's important to me. And it's important to me because it helps me grow as well. Like it's, it's selfish too. I mean, it helps me create better work, become a, a more expanded kind of human. And so, um, yeah, so that was, that's a huge part of Nama's arc where we are involving music from various traditions and bringing together people from those different cultures to actually make the music. And it's gonna be so exciting. Yeah. yeah. And, and more, more to come on that in the yes. next few minutes. Um, we have another video, and, and this video is um, sort of going to transition us to talk about Constellation for a little bit, and then we'll get into the rest of our panel. Um, this video is, is a film that you're working on with your group that includes you as one of the performers, but also gives us a nice introduction to your group. And I think we're going to show about a two-minute segment of that clip. Is there anything that you'd like to tell us about that? Sure. So this is from a project of mine called the Desire Divinity Project. And that's where Song of Song of Songs is, comes from. And also another sister piece called Sappho Fragments, which is the poetry of, of Sappho, the Greek poet, um, translated by Anne Carson, the scholar and writer. And I've, I've put that into movement and voice. And we're also, as a side project to that, making films for each of the fragments that we're going to be performing at, in installations, in live installations and in galleries. So this is one of them. And why don't we just stop it after two minutes, kind of wherever it is. And uh, yeah, the other three, this is a women's quartet, and the other three women in it are in my ensemble. Great. Yeah. Let's take a look. Go and remember me. Rejoice. Go and remember me. How in sweet oil you anointed yourself.
tears and she she That's so powerful! Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. So that is, those member those are members of Constellation Core. And yes. That is a group that you have founded. Yeah. And work with very intimately. Yeah. Um, how do you choose the members of this group? Yeah. So I the first uh, the first priority for me in choosing people for this group is their spirits and their energies and their life force. That's the first thing that draws me to people and that I'm looking for. And um, that translates into a real alive sense of um, depth in performance. And um, then, of course, I'm also interested in people's virtuosic singing and virtuosic movement and being creative artistic individuals. But the very first thing is that there's like an energetic life force and curiosity and playfulness yeah. in the world. Yeah. That's fantastic. And you said the group meets every week and then you do retreats. And mm -hmm. is it, so, you know, maybe some people in the audience are thinking, well, how do you like write that music and sing that? Is it notated? I mean, are they looking at sheets of music or is it? it oh, I wish I had given an example of this notation. It's so interesting. It is notated. Um, a, a lot of the music, all of the music I write is notated, um, often just somewhat traditionally. In this case, it was uh, huge pieces of paper with boxes to denote each section of music. And then there were kind of drawings of lines to indicate where the vocal line is supposed to go and, and names for pitches like C to D flat here. And, um, and then accompanying drawings to indicate where there's, imp where there's an improv moment and how that improv moment should feel. And uh, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really cool score. But one part of our practice as a group is improvisation, because improvising together requires a deep listening experience, and it requires an inquiry into balancing listening and receiving, and also taking action, taking responsibility and giving. And it's a process that I, I think would be useful for every single person, no matter what field they're in, to improvise, is to, to have to confront in each moment, um, who am I right now? Am I someone who's taking up a lot of space and I can step back and give someone else a chance to, to sing? Or is this actually my moment to be taking up a lot of space and I'm gonna keep going because that's the greatest offering I can give? Um, or am I afraid right now? Am I feeling like what I'm gonna give is going to not be good enough? And then it has to, you know, confronting those questions of, am I good enough? Am I good enough? And is this coming, where is this impulse in me coming from? Is it coming from the true me? Or is this something that I'm just doing that I've heard before? So entering into a process like that is incredible because those questions and those experiences come up every time. And, it's a, and then also it's a great community building process with the people you work with because you get to know uh, each person intimately and their, their unique gifts and how your gifts interact with their gifts. So it's a, an empowering process. And I love that for beyond just music. Absolutely. Course, that's something that happens in a, any conversation that you have, yeah. personally, professionally, yeah. any relationship that you have. Totally, so. totally. Well, I'd love to get the rest of our panel involved in the conversation yeah. and talk about Nama's Ark, this community or oratorio. And Carol Ann, Professor Mata said, I'd love to start with you because without you, None of this would be, ha you, you're, the, you're our point of entry um, for this project. How did it all happen? Well, I belong to the National Opera Association. I've been a member of this group for probably 25 years, ever since I came here uh, to SUU. And we have a segment of uh, the National Opera Association that deals with the sacred in opera. And every three years, we try to put on uh, a, a sacred uh, uh, piece and do it in a sacred setting. The other thing that is so important about this uh, group is the fact that they want 
people to embrace all religions, all cultures. And um, that is kind of their mandate. And so this is the year uh, that, that where this comes around. And um, our national conference is going to be in Salt Lake City. And guess who is the national chair local host for this? Moi. <laughs> and so uh, as I started working on this with the board, uh, one of my colleagues approached me. He's at the University of Delaware, and he is actually uh, the person who is in charge of this sacred and opera. And uh, he said, well, I've got this wonderful composer, that, and I think that we should do one of her works. And I said, oh, great. You know, I think that that sounds fabulous. Uh, but we need to do it in a sacred setting. Well, you know, I'm down here in Cedar City, so I started exploring and looking and trying to find uh, a good sacred place to do this. And I finally decided on the Cathedral of the Madeline. And, I mean, it's just a perfect place. Uh, and Marissa sent me scores to look at. And then I enlisted Crystal <laughs> and said, okay, I want you to take a look at these. And what do you think that our kids could do chorally? And so she looked at it and she said, oh, Namazark, that's the one we should do. So then I said, okay, that's what we're going to do then. And so then the process is, this is going to be, this is a, um, uh, an important event for us. As I said, it only happens every three years. And uh, so this year it's going to be at the conference in Salt Lake City. And we're going to do it on a Friday evening. And it's one of the pinnacles of our conference. And we're very, very excited. I'm excited by the music. I'm excited about the students. I'm excited about the fact that we are doing this in a, a Catholic church, and, uh, um, and that we are we are bringing together. This is the thing that is so remarkable about this piece because it brings in all cultures and religions, and I think that that is such an important aspect of what we as educators should be having. Uh, allowing our students to be exposed to. Thank you. That's, that's so cool to hear how it all happened. And you'll be hearing more about it. We're going to be up in Salt Lake in January, and then we are going to be coming back down here to perform it January 12th. So let's get involved with some of the... Crystal, I'd love to talk to you about some of the, the, the challenges of this from a singing standpoint. And also, you're so intimately connected with the score now. Maybe you can speak to... There's so many different languages and different, some of the different religions and the different um, aspects of it, the characters. Maybe tell us about that side of it if you can. Sure. Um, it, thank you, Marissa, for this fascinating work because we are just all so engaged and inspired by it, aren't we, singers? Yeah. So, um, you know, that I would probably say um, something that I really connect with is the, um, the extended vocal technique that's called for in the score. And that's something that my singers know I work on a lot in developing different types of singing for different styles, from different countries, from different cultures. And so we really connect with Marissa's score uh, and do our best to be authentic. And, and I love that Marissa says, you know, let the music inspire your singing. Don't look at it and think that you know. Sing it and then let the music tell you what to do. So uh, we love that fact of it. I think that um, the characters uh, are wonderful. The students are really enjoying thinking about the characters, especially Nama. Um, what, a beautiful, what a beautiful role model for all of the students. One of my favorite things that Nama does is she is brave enough to change the narrative of her life. And she retells, she tells her own story. Um, and she steps out of that and goes, searches and goes within and, and writes her own story, which I think that's something that we kind of want everyone to be doing, you know, to, to break from that traditional narrative and really think about where you belong in the world. Um, so we love that part of it. I, um, you know, so I'm just kind of doing, preparing the music and, and learning the score and teaching the score and then learning Marissa's um, we're so lucky, it doesn't often occur that you can invite the composer to come and that you can spend time with the composer and that the students can ask questions of the composer. So thank you, Lynn, for um, supporting this Apex event and it's been wonderful to get time with Marissa. And, uh, and then, of course, we've been working on 
getting, you know, I'm also the tour manager because I'm getting the buses and we're getting the hotel, right? I mean, the hotel rooms. And so there's all of that other lovely stuff. And th shout out to Lexi. Thank you for your support and the financial side. So that's a little bit from me. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's, that's really cool. And, and so then we decided we're going to get dance involved, right? And so, Michael, this is, and, and I think this is your second year here. Second year. Yeah. And second year. How did the dance component even come to be? Because originally it's not written for dance, really. Yeah, but I, so exciting to have dance. Yeah, it's just a brand new thing. How did you come yeah. into it? So uh, first I wanna thank Marissa for this beautiful work. This has been an exciting opportunity. It's not lost on me that it's my second year and I was given this opportunity, so <laughs> thank you. Um, Shauna and Crystal both initiated my involvement and I said yes very quickly. I think it was, can you, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> And I think um, one of the things that really fascinates me about Marissa's work is the ability to allow the body to be a conduit for something that's very authentic and expressive. And so it was really this back and forth between what are the functional components of this movement and what are the expressive components. And with function, it became how can I use movement as a conduit to be an expression of the music. And then with expressivity, it's what do the dancers have to offer as unique individuals for who they are, where they can make creative decisions that are a response to the music. So it really was ebb, an ebb and flow between functionality and expressivity. Mm. Are there any uh, physical themes or um, uh, specific shapes that we can look for perhaps in the work today or? Yes, so because the section we're gonna be viewing today and listening to Rainbow is a conjuring of different colors, there's uh, this notion that orange has a certain jagged sensibility and green has a rising sensibility. I don't wanna give anything else away. Ah, that's so <laughs> but cool. Those are, yeah. Have there been any um, in, any challenges in mm -hmm. particular with this work mm -hmm. that, um, that are unique to it? I think what, what's been unique about this work is that it's very easy to read a linear narrative inside of this and I'm actually making choices to steer away from that in an effort to allow a little bit more room for abstraction and expressivity. Ah. And it really, how can the dancers, dancers cultivate that instead of me as the choreographer ascribing who they are in this world? Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, I'd love to kind of dovetail back to Crystal on that. Um, in your preparations, I mean, there's so many different languages, not particularly in the movement we're going to see today, but in some of the other movements. And I mean, I don't speak very many languages. You probably speak a lot more than I do. How do you go about language? I mean, we have a lot of musicians in the room who do that all the time, but how do you go about preparing different languages, um, the different shapes of the mouth? How, how, what is that like? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, shout out to Justin Olson in the house. Um, Justin immediately, and actually 15, was it Justin, or 16 languages? You will hear today in the performance of the Rainbow Movement, 16 oh, different cool. languages. Oh, cool. There are 16 in it, Rainbow. Yes, I thought, yeah, which okay, I great. assume that that was inspired perhaps by colors, diversity in colors of languages. I don't... Yeah, so this, the Rainbow song is the moment the rainbow appears. And the, um, I, I, took, I looked for translations of each color and in many different languages and wrote them down. And then I actually looked for commonalities between the languages in consonants or vowel. Um, and uh, then I made up my own words based on the commonalities I saw in the language of different words. And some of the words are actually like the word for red in, in French, for example. But there's some words that are made up based on what seemed common. Yeah, so to get back, you know, um, it, as, as singers and choral conductors, you have to take your IPA diction classes, don't you? Yeah, so, you know, we typically, we're well-versed and we love Latin, although I don't know, I don't think there was any, but, you know, Latin, we study French, we study German. Um, a lot of us in America are, Spanish is becoming a secondary normal thing in our country, and so those languages are very typical. Um, I started teaching at, in a little school in New Jersey that was predominantly Jewish, so Hebrew for me is natural. Um, I, it's like singing in Latin. So it was nice to recognize some languages, but I also want to say that our students from Utah who serve all of these fabulous missions and go around the world, um, even Ashley Brower, 
oh no, this word is Korean, and you say it like this. And so I, some of the students have even, and then we've had Justin who has done the research on the internet. Um, and then when there is something that still could be a made up word, we turn to the composer. And I think she does have some notes for us on that account. But so yeah, that's kind of how we deal with the languages. Great. Yeah. Plus you put them all over the, the whiteboards in the room. I, wa I walked in and, and uh, to teach a class and I was like, do not erase this board. And, and they, they were everywhere. <laughs> Justin did that and it was amazing. And I just said, please, please, please do not. It, it was up for a couple of days. Yeah, and we've also decorated our classroom and I have to show Marissa too before she goes. But yeah, the languages have really inspired us. And is there anything else in this process that, uh, from the singer standpoint, that has been new or um, different, or you know, any sort of breakthroughs that have happened? Uh, yeah, I in in the learning of the music, you know, we started learning the rainbow, and green is quite intense for, um, especially if you're used to seeing a typical homophonic choral score, which means everyone sings the same thing at the same time in the same language. And that is, you'll hear green. That is not the case. Green is so beautiful. Um, so when we started, I think it was a lot to bite off. Uh, but once the music started su surrounding the students and they started living in it and to watch my students change and really turn on, I mean, you will not hear what is my most favorite movement today. So you have to come on January the 12th to the Randall. Um, but there's just, Marissa, thank you, because her music just speaks to us and, it, and it's in our heads all the time. And oh, we're just... It means so much. Really. We love living it, don't we? We love living in it. So, yeah. Wow, that's great. And I twisted our amazing Dean's arm to join us on stage today because um, Shauna Mendini is the Dean of the College of Performing and Visual Arts and I don't know, you are just like the life force of everything that makes us go. And I, Marissa and I have been talking about you and, and you really took this project as you have done many times before with other projects and just said, this is important for us to do. So I'd love to hear from you you know, why you really feel so strongly about this kind of collaboration and bringing all this together and getting the dancers involved and, and we're gonna go up and we're gonna travel. And I mean, this is, tell us about what this means for you and what you feel this means for our students. Thanks, Lynn. You know, um, in the performing of visual arts, faculty demand opportunities for collaboration. It allows us to know more about what our art is. And if you don't provide these opportunities, faculty get a little restless. And it's important that they have these opportunities. There are things that you just simply cannot say no to and you find a way to make them happen. And this project is one of those. Uh, what's so exciting is it speaks to us on multiple levels, not only from the standpoint of faculty development and their own creative growth, but also our students. How do our students learn and interface with the living, dynamic, progressive, experimental composer that we don't always have an opportunity in Cedar City to interface with? How does that prepare our students? Um, the excitement of being able to use this work in a larger context, a larger community, up in Salt Lake and bringing multiple cultures together with their authentic voice. Not us trying to be that culture, but bringing community together. So how do we reach out so that we have an authentic, Muslim, Muslim call to worship, Muslim call to prayer. That's part of this production. So how do we bring that under the fold? How do we reach out to Calgary Baptist Church up in Salt Lake and make sure that we bring in gospel singers that will be part of this production? How do we reach out to synagogues in Salt Lake to be part of this production? How do our students interface with these cultures? How do these cultures inform our students in preparation for the world that they're going to face that is ever changing? So these things in the bare foundation of educational purpose of our institution and who we are as people are critical in terms of preparing for the students for the next step. So Thank you, Marissa, for this material because on so many levels, it speaks.
And then to have a beautiful woman, young woman composer in the cathedral of St. Mary Magdalene in Salt Lake, telling a story, these two women in that space, what does that speak? How does that tell us about our future? So there's very, very exciting things that are part of this, and we are absolutely thrilled, Marissa, to be part of it. Yay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And, yeah. uh, you know, a little more on the scope of it, because what you're going to see, just we're, we're right about getting time for our performance here to show you. But um, maybe we can talk a little bit to the scope, and I, I probably won't even have it all, but there's going to be hundreds of people involved in this performance. And as you said, um, we're, we're reaching out to synagogues, we're reaching out to the Baptist church to get a you know, gospel choir to combine in with our students. And um, you know, there's, gonna, there's a drum circle, there's professional musicians, we're going to have a call to prayer. Uh, a Hispanic choir, and, 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 and am I forgetting anything? <laughs> That's the no, choir. Oh, that's the shul choir. choir. Yeah, oh, the, uh, the Jewish okay. the children's choir. You did say synagogues, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of these there is people. a high school choir as a well. High school yeah. Choir. Oh yeah, there will be ninety high school singers and a middle school, and uh, all four of those schools are um, the choir directors are graduates of SUU. Yeah. So it's even reaching out to our SUU community in Salt Lake. Yeah. That's fantastic. Can you tell us any more about Nama's work? And then we'll, we'll then, we'll then. We'll about Nama's about. Ark, the yeah, piece? I'm sorry, about yeah. Nama's Ark. <laughs> yeah, so this is a story, a retelling of the story of Noah's Ark from his wife's perspective. And once they land uh, on land, once the water has gone away, and the question for Nama, who's really the one in charge of helping all of the different animals resettle in the new land, is how is this going to be possible? Essentially, we all hate each other and wanted to kill each other on this, on this ark. How are we going to make a life together in a new place? Um, and, and she's the leader because no, in, in this version, Noah is off uh, drinking and he's not really doing much and so it's up to her and then her question is how, how am I going to make this possible for for the people in, in my care and in the end she actually makes a personal decision for herself and her own growth and her own evolution to uh, I mean I can give it away I mean right it's not it's not so suspenseful but she joins this character of the merman and chooses to enter the world of mythology rather than stay in the world as it is. It's too painful for her right now, but she, in making that choice, is actually um, making a choice to come back in the future. And so she, d she just chooses to help settle all the creatures and then make her way into the land of mythology, which is why in this perspective we have never heard from her and she really has no name in, in the stories that have been passed down. And, and she may come back. I mean, there may, is, is that the idea? Yeah, that the idea. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're ready to get things going. So I'd like to say thank you so much to Professor Monica, Dean Mendini, uh, Michael Crotty, and Crystal McCoy for being on stage with me. And we'd like to invite the students to come on up. And while they're coming up, maybe we can talk about Rainbow just briefly. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. What is Rainbow? This piece that we're going to hear today, what is that? So the rainbow moment um, in, in the score, so this is about an hour long oratorio, and Nama has just, all of the animals have gone to sleep, they're going to be leaving the ark the next morning, and Nama has sung what's called Nama's prayer, which is a prayer to God, spirit, and said, give me a sign, is this going to be okay? And then we hear actually um, the call to prayer and then, oh actually that happens right before her, we hear the call to prayer and then she sings her prayer and then she sees, she looks up and she sees the rainbow. And in the same moment that she looks up and sees a rainbow, all of the animals look up and see a rainbow and this is the voiced manifestation of the rainbow. And all the colors, so we'll hear. All the colors, we go one by one, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Perfect. Yeah. All right, well, I think we're just going to get the rest of the singers on stage and we'll Great. hear. This will be probably the west, 
most Western premiere of this? Absolutely, piece? yeah. This all right, is a Western, Western premiere. premiere. I mean, you're yeah. hearing it. You're here. So, all right. As soon as they get set, we'll have Rainbow from mm -hmm. Nama's Ark by Marissa Michelson. Yes, and awesome. Royce Fabrak as well. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you.
thank you so much to SEU music students, members of our choir, uh, and magical ensembles. Thank you to SEU dancers. Thank you to all of the members of the panel today and for all of your creative endeavors. And thank you so much to Marissa Michelson for the creation of this amazing work. Uh, January 4th in the Cathedral of the Madeline up in Salt Lake City. January 12th right here on campus at our Randall Auditorium. Uh, you can absolutely find out all the details on either the Apex website or on the SEU Music Department website or the College of Performing and Visual Arts. So thank you so much to everyone for being here today. And let's continue to just celebrate the music and the spirit of the world. Thank you. Thank you.